Welcome to The Growth Factor, a broadcast ministry of St. Mark Baptist Church. Today, as part of our family, you will experience the life-changing and spirit-nurturing Word of God. Please enjoy this time with us as we're committed to helping you grow in knowledge, grow in faith, and grow in God. St. Mark Baptist Church, you grow here. Well, welcome back to the Growth Factor podcast, a broadcast ministry of the St. Mark Baptist Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. My name is Pastor John. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at St. Mark. And as always, I'm joined by our senior pastor, Dr. Philip L. Porner, Sr. Uh, For the past several sessions, we've been talking about digging deeper and helping you all to be able to dig deeper in your personal time and studying God's word. And we want to help you to make it make sense. So we've been walking you all through different methodologies to help you to make God's word make sense and provide you with some tools to be able to do so. And we're right in the middle of helping folks to interpret it Mm -hmm. as we look at genres of scripture. Mm -hmm. We looked at several genres up until now. Our last session covered parables. Well, this go around. We're going to get a little spooky. I know yeah. I know. last season we talked about a spooky holiday. <laughs> well, this season we're going to be talking about spooky scripture. Spooky Bible. <laughs> As we talk about apocalyptic literature. And here's why I think this is important, uh, Pete, because I think that one of the worst things in Christian practice is allowing spooky Christians to get a hold of spooky scripture. Oh man. Woo. How much time do we have? Cause, cause when cause, they do, cause, 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 cause how much time do we have? Cause, <laughs> cause, cause if, if I get on spooky Christians and spooky scripture, um, mm. it is, it is one of the great challenges mm-hmm. of our life of development in faith one of the things we are tempted to do is to continue to, instead of improve our spirituality, to yeah. just prove it. Mm. And rather than to continue to, to grow, we, we feel like we need to display yeah. how much we've grown mm. all the time. Mm. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the misunderstanding of much of the scripture, and especially apocalyptic literature, these people who say, I know exactly the day and the moment and the time, and it's going to be this date, and this means that, and, 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 and you're way, 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 all the way, not even close to being on. You're all the way on. <laughs> it's, it's just an attempt. It's, it's an attempt to speak things for God mm. that God has not spoken for God's own self. Mm. And the scary part about it is we one of the, books we're going to be talking about the end the end says hey anyone who adds or takes away mm. i'll take away their part from the book of life yeah uh and so that's it's 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 so important um that we approach all of the scripture with humility especially the apocalyptic uh portions of scripture so that so that the bible is deep enough mm. we don't we don't have to try to make it deeper yeah than it is god intends for us to understand god's word God gave it to us for for our knowledge and edification so we can know God, so we can understand our need for Christ, so we can know how to relate to God through Jesus Christ by faith and how to live as people who believe in Christ. And that includes these kinds of passages Mm. and those extended uh, passages, a whole book of the Bible, even at the end. Uh, That's going to that we're going to discuss tonight, Pastor John. Yeah. And we've talked about this before about the simplicity of the message of God's word. Mm -hmm. Like this was Mm -hmm. supposed to be accessible to so many people. And then when you try to get deep and spooky with it, you try to make it inaccessible because now you have this particular knowledge that people have to come to you to get about God's word. And that was never God's intention for us to be able to seek out these deep spooky understandings of what who he is he mm-hmm. always has meant to reveal himself yes to his people so for someone to come along and say i got a special revelation from god yeah and ain't nobody in all the church history nobody never had else, that revelation nobody else knows this but me <laughs> we got a problem yeah yeah so, it, yeah go ahead. It, it's 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 a we talked about these this group in the early christian community mm-hmm. before the gnostics 
um, spelled with a silent G, G N O S T I C S. The Gnostics uh, comes from this Greek word gnosis, which is knowledge, but they believe they have this special knowledge, mm. and they're not that 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 sect has not died out. They're still they're the new Gnostics <laughs> who believe they have this special knowledge. But we want to we want to uh, um, dispel that myth. That there's just some special knowledge that some people have about the scripture that other people don't get to have. Mm. That's not how that's not how God works at all. So in this session, we're going to help you interpret apocalyptic literature. Mm -hmm. And listen, we ain't going to be deep and spooky either. No. We're going to use biblical interpretive principles to help you be able to interpret apocalyptic literature throughout scripture. Now, what we have to start, though, is with this uh, idea of eschatology. This is a big mm. seminary word that we learned. We're going to unpack it for you right quick, though, yeah. because um, so that word logos at the end means the study of and eschatos means the last days. Mm. So you have theology, which is the study of God. You have ecclesiology, which is ecclesia, the study of the church. You have Christology, the study of Christ, mm. and then you have pneumatology. Mm. And the pneuma means spirit. So you have the study of the Holy Spirit. So there is a discipline mm -hmm. in theology that studies the end or the last days called eschatology. Yeah. Eschatology. Yeah. Eschatology is, a, is one of those areas um, where, again, there is a lot of opinion mm. and uh, people hold to beliefs tightly when we should hold them in humility mm -hmm. because and I want to say this at the outset if you've been hanging around St. Mark any length of time you've heard me say this ad nauseum prophecy can only be understood in retrospect yeah in its fullness to its fullest degree we can understand the prophets of the old covenant because we looked we look back to them through the lens of Jesus Christ who has fulfilled the prophecies about his first coming. Now, when we look forward to his second coming and the events that precede it, that are involved in it, and that, and that are a result of it, because it hasn't happened, there are some things we do not know mm -hmm. and will not know <laughs> right. until he comes again. And we'll say that a lot during this during This, this is the, this is what, John, this might be, the key yeah. to understanding apocalyptic literature is to know that the eschaton, the, the last days, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we'll talk about what they are in a moment, um, when they start or had started, <laughs> um, and, and what they all include, uh, but, but that, that's in God's own purview, and only God has full knowledge of all of the matters that 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 pertain to that uh, last day. Yeah. So I want to give people some comfort here mm -hmm. because one of the greatest theologians of all time, his name is John Calvin. He started a movement that's been come to known as Calvinism, but wrote a whole systematic theology on this. He wrote an entire book. Uh, he decided that he was not going to write a commentary on the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. He just said, no, nah, that's, too, that's too, much. <laughs> too much. He stopped right there. Yeah. He wrote commentaries on many of the other books of the Bible, but John Calvin, mm -hmm. one of the preeminent scholars, theologians, said, oh, I'm good. I'm good on that. I'm good on <laughs> that. I'm good on so that. So as yeah. we work through that tonight, y'all, I need y'all to keep that in mind, mm -hmm. that even some of the greatest minds mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. have decided that they are they not even going to touch it. Yes, but we're going to try to. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to try to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I, what, what we need to know when we're talking about uh, apocalyptic literature, one of the things that we need to distinguish, and we'll say prophecy a lot in this um, time of study, but we want to draw that line of demarcation between what is prophetic um, scripture, prophetic literature, and what is apocalyptic literature. Yeah. Um, that's an important distinction because everything that's prophetic is not apocalyptic. Mm. Uh, prophetic simply means prophecy is simply to speak forth. So it is not, you know, people, we, especially in the West now, we think prophecy is fortune telling. We think the prophet is the one who comes and says, um, you know, your address is 12937 Main Street, 
and your mama's name is Jean, and your father's name is Arthur. And listen, those things can be legitimate. Many times they have been abused, um, especially if they say, "Give me some money," but if you want this prophecy, <laughs> then that's that's a that's a charlatan. That's a, that's a clown right there. Bless your heart. Um, but but prophecy is to speak forth. Mm-hmm. Now I'm gonna. Every time we stand to open the Bible and explain it, mm. we are prophesying. Yeah. In the purest sense of the word, it is simply to say what God has said. That's it. That's what prophecy is. It is to say what God has said. Now, what it is most aligned to in our minds mm. is to say what God has said about something that has not yet happened. Mm. And that's why we think everything apocalyptic or in the future that all is prophecy and prophecy is always in the future no sometimes is saying hey go to the stove because your grits are burning <laughs> and that's happening right now and that's prophecy you understand what i'm saying that that prophecy is is simply saying what god has said pastor john that's mm. that's that's so we want to make that distinction so when we talk about interpreting apocalyptic literature mm. one of the things that we want to read for especially if, if we're talking about apocalyptic literature in the Old Covenant, we want to read for if it describes something futuristic, is it something that has already happened historically? Mm-hmm. Because some of the Old Testament prophecies were about things that had happened or things that were happening or things that would happen, but they would not be in the last days. And so some things are prophecy we interpret them as prophecy, but they already happened. Hmm. That happened already. Yeah. Um, I'll give you the big one. They, the prophets said Jesus would be born. <laughs> he would live. He would die and he would rise. Hmm. Well, we interpret it when I read Isaiah talking about that. When I read Jeremiah speaking about those things, when I read uh, uh, Micah speaking about those things, I interpret them in my scripture as prophecy. But I do not uh, interpret them as apocalyptic, as to happen, they have happened. Yeah. And so I want to make sure that we make that distinction so that, so that I don't act like Christ's first coming is a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so right. when I approach apocalyptic literature, there's mystery. There's, I, I come with the humble understanding that there are some things that are, that are in God's own understanding uh, and that, that are yet to be revealed in their fullness. When it comes to what has happened, I can interpret that scripture, that passage as prophecy while understanding that the mm-hmm. events are history. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, that makes, I hope that's been clear. It does. And and it, I think it's safe to say that there is not one book in scripture that is purely apocalyptic. Um, many of you all may drive hybrid cars. Mm-hmm. Where you're going to find that the book of Revelation is a hybrid book. It's a hybrid book. It is a letter mm-hmm. written to seven churches mm-hmm. in the opening chapters. It is also prophetic. It yeah. has prophecy in it. And it also has apocalyptic literature in it as well. So it's a hybrid. It's not even purely apocalyptic. So when people it's read not. Revelation, they're like, oh, this is apocalyptic. Well, there's some letters to some churches there's in there. Some, there's some actual happening right now that's yeah. going on. Yeah. And man, we're not doing a Bible study on Revelation, but let me <laughs> let me give let me give you 17 of my Revelation pet peeves. <laughs> One, it is the book of Revelation, Ooh, singular. Please, no S. Please. Revelation, singular. Now, Psalms is Psalms with an S. Proverbs is Proverbs with an S. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes with an S. Revelation. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Revelation. One revelation. That's what it is. It is one revelation. I've seen albums. Oh, yeah. Album covers with revelations <laughs> on them. Yes. And I've, I've just lost my mind. Listen, I've, <laughs> I've heard earned doctors <laughs> lettered in the church from some of the best schools in the country say turn with me to the book of revelations and i want to get up and and and, and john scream. had one <laughs> revelation yeah, one revelation <laughs> but that revelation had as 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 you said john it had it had what's going on now the apostle john the beloved disciple was the 
overseer of these churches, the, the bishop of these churches in, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wrote pastorally to them. Yeah. If, if, we, if we stopped after the letters to the seven churches, we would interpret the revelation, that book, as we interpret Hebrews and First mm-hmm. and Second Peter mm-hmm. and and James, yep. it, that same kind of literature. Then it has some some apocalyptic matters about the last of the last days mm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. And you've already touched on some distinctions between prophetic and apocalyptic literature, but want to drive that point home and just give them a few more. Uh, generally, when you see prophecy, you're going to see the Lord directly speaking to the prophet or you see this, the prophet proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. Uh, in apocalyptic literature, what you're going to find is that there's a mediator. Yes. Uh, generally in the form of an angel mm-hmm. who comes to a person to mediate the voice that's coming from God. So there's someone who's a middle man, middle person. Mm-hmm. Uh, who is actually mediating the conversation and dialogue with the third person, which we see in Revelation with John himself. Yeah, and and that that mediating voice is not unheard of in Scripture. It's the same kind of experience that Mary has when um, she has the conversation with Gabriel about the fact that she is blessed and highly favored and will become uh, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Gabriel talking uh, to others in Scripture, and then there is a distinction there, and... And this is what separates the two. Mm. The prophet has his or her ear to God's mouth. Mm. The person who writes apocalyptic literature or to whom is revealed apocalyptic literature is writing, as it were, with a dialogue about something that an angel is showing or revealing God is going to do. Mm. One as it were, in prophecy, God is speaking. Mm. In apocalyptic literature, it's as if God is just acting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 a sideline reporter. It's the commentator in the game while God is running the ball up and down the field. That's good. That 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 gives us that distinction there. Yeah, yeah. So we've already talked about kind of the timeline features between prophecy and apocalyptic literature. I want to give folks a definition of the apocalypse because Mm -hmm. it's well misunderstood, especially in our current cultural context, because apocalypse actually does not mean the end of the world. It does not. The word apocalypse in scripture does not mean the end of the world. And part of this is shaped by our perception of of culture and what culture has taught us Mm -hmm. Uh, starting in the seventies. That's been this movement of apocalyptic authors that culminated in the left behind series by Tim Leahy that demonstrated this kind of uh, end of the world apocalypse type of language that people, in fact, the Miriam Webster dictionary actually defines the first definition says the description of the destruction and the end of the world as described in revelation. Right, Right. And I'm like, Wait a second. What? <laughs> <laughs> right, what? Right, right. But that's not what it is. In, ter- in terms of the word itself, the apocalypse actually is derived from a Greek word. And again, this goes back to our uh, study on words as we talked about transliteration. It actually is transliterated from the Greek, which is apocalypsis, mm-hmm. which means um, uncovering. Uncovering. Or revelation. That's where we get our, the, the direct translation of the Greek word from which we get apocalypse mm-hmm. is revelation or even better, perhaps to despookify it. <laughs> it just means uncovering, Un- uncovering. It's I mean, an that, uncovering. that's probably a better definition um, as we're looking at Revelation one. That is the first couple of words. It says the uncovering, the uncovering of the vision given to John here. And, right. And woo, we could we could we could we could we could we could go. <laughs> let me. Here's the thing about that uncovering. It is not so the Genesis one gives us a creating. Yes, sir. Revelation one gives us an uncovering. And that's mm-hmm. an important note that we come from s- there being nothing to something mm. to being something we can't see that has to be uncovered. uncovered. Yeah. So first of all, Everything folk are scared of in the end of the world mm. is already set. God has set 
God's redemptive purposes in motion. Isaiah said he has called the end from the beginning. Yeah, that's good. And what God has graciously done through divine communication, the divine communication that we call revelation, Mm -hmm. is that God has graciously given us a preview Mm -hmm. or an understanding of the unfolding of redemptive events. And when we read Revelation, we understand exactly why. Mm. So that we can remain faithful to Christ, so that we can be comforted Mm. in our suffering, and so that we can be warned against falling away. God graciously uncovers. I ain't going to tell you the whole thing, but I'm going to tell you what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. It's it's God. Here it is. It's, it's God. God didn't give you any greens mm. out the pot, but he gave you some cornbread and let you dip it in the pot liquor. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So that you can you can hold you, you, you can hold on till the greens get. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. It is an, it's already there. The, 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 the ham hock is already in the greens. We, we already we already smelling up the house. <laughs> greens are on the way. Yes, sir. But but this is some pot liquor to hold you over. Mm. To to again, to encourage you to be faithful to Christ, to comfort you in your suffering, and ultimately to keep you from falling away. And then also in, in many instances in Scripture, I know we got to move, but in many instances in Scripture, the verb form of this revealed actually comes to play in the life of Paul, mm-hmm. as Paul is talking to the church at Galatia, and he says this. He says this was not received by man, this revelation of the mm-hmm. gospel. He says it was a apocalypto. Yep. It was revealed to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Um, and then that goes back to Acts nine where how it was revealed how to it him. It was revealed. Yes. He was knocked off his horse yep. and he found himself blind. He was blind for God. to re- So he could see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, can't, we yeah. can't go further than yeah. that, but you see that this idea of, revealing happens in the personal space here or uh, for Paul himself because that was revealed to him that apocalypto to him yeah and, yeah and 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 I want to I want to put along this train track the the word Armageddon as well because mm-hmm. Armageddon is yeah. also used in that same way well Armageddon is coming Armageddon is a place mm-hmm. it's not a it's not a event it is a place you can travel to we have been there it's called Har Megiddo, it's a valley yep. um, that is an intersection between um, the nations, a very critical place. In fact, um, the nation of Israel still has, it's an important military outpost for them even to this day. Uh, and so these ideas, again, we want to de this. This is not the end of the world and oh my goodness, <laughs> what's, you know, and it's not, it's not Armageddon, it's mm-hmm. God uncovering. And, and there will be a battle at a place where there have been battles for many, many thousands of years. Mm. Megiddo is a place where battles happen. Yeah. Uh, and so those ideas, and so when we read these things, we, have to, we, think, we are to think of them in the same way God is intervening in history right now, active in history right now. God is active in what will be history. What we, will, what we call the future is just... God's history not yet uh, experienced. Mm. Mm. It's just God intervening in the same way God has intervened and ruled all throughout creation's timeline. God will always be doing that. And God is simply saying, this is the way I'm going to do it in the days that are to come. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what makes it all spooky for a lot of people is is that apocalyptic literature generally comes in the form of dreams mm-hmm. visions yeah these symbols that um, people ascribe greater meaning to than they should so i think that it's important for us in this episode to to help people to interpret this literature with some of the interpretive prim- principles that we know mm-hmm. and that we understand. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to leave y'all to yourself. No. We, we could say, God bless you. Go read, <laughs> go read revelation, but we want to help <laughs> yeah. you out here a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So I think I want to start by talking about uh, any apocalyptic literature is always going to have some form of pastoral concern. Yes. You're going to find that in the book of Daniel, mm-hmm. um, Daniel and his 
colleagues are in exile mm-hmm. in Bab- in Babylon, and they need hope. Mm-hmm. And so, so the apocalyptic literature there demonstrates to them, and we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, that even though your current circumstances are dire, yes, that there's help on the way. Yeah, and 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 let's take the two big buckets, John, mm-hmm. Daniel, and the Book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John. Yeah, when we look at Daniel, and you look at his ministry in Babylon, you know, you you get. So, again, a blended book, a hybrid book of six chapters of narrative, um, a primarily narrative form. And then the last half of the book is primarily uh, prophetic apocalyptic. Um, what is interesting is who is he talking to? Mm-hmm. Now, you got to remember, Daniel's a very high official in Babylon. Um, he serves for um, uh, years. He is well into his 80s. You know, we... Yeah see the handwriting on the wall incident he's in his 80s man he's an old guy at that point and who is he talking to well there are other exiles though he has risen high and though Mm -hmm. he is doing well and trusted implicitly by the by the by the kings of babylon uh and called upon for wisdom and all of Mm -hmm. those things Mm -hmm. he's he's concerned about his people Mm. That's good. About about God's people. And whatever else he's been able to accomplish in his life there in Babylon, succeeding in in that very secular and, and extremely mostly wicked environment, mm. his concern for his people allows him to be available for when God speaks to him through the angel to say, this is what's happening. Mm. This is what God is up to in the lives of his people. Hmm. Yeah. See, see, y'all just learned that Daniel was a house Israelite. Yeah. <laughs> you catch that <laughs> on the other side of that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> John, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the other thing we got to understand. It is hilarious. (laughs) We have to understand the messaging for the original audience. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this uh, ad nauseum on the on on the sessions in these sessions, right? Yeah. That you got to understand the original context and the original audience. Otherwise, you're going to miss the point. Right. Uh, I, I want to point out an example in Revelation chapter nine, mm-hmm. um, and we can take a look at it. It's only four verses, so let's go ahead and look at that real fast. And this is an example where there are seven trumpets of judgment that are occurring here in this particular chapter, and uh, this is the fifth trumpet that blows. And you guys have heard about this bottomless pit mm-hmm. that uh, people talk about. Well, this is where the bottomless pit occurs and where Satan and his so if you're a parent of teenage boys like me this is helpful because it it would seem to me that I feed two boys <laughs> whose bellies are the bottomless pit but not so this this is the real one this is the actual bottomless pit that Satan and his demons spring from yeah Lord thank you for one day <laughs> the, the the pit will find the bottom thank you Jesus and so that when they sprang from that bottomless pit, let's look at what happens in verse number seven, because it describes these figures that spring up. Mm-hmm. It says, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair were like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the no and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is called Apoll- Apollyon. So here's what some folks do with this. Mm. They say that and it's tempting to do it. It is tempting yeah. because it looks like it could be right. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're saying that the demons that spring from this bottomless pit at the end of the world are going to be helicopters. Right. 
Look at the description here. Mm -hmm. It says their wings was like the noise of many chariots. Yep. They loud. They have toys, t tails, and stings like scorpions. They got weapons on them and the power to hurt people. So it sounds like it could be helicopters. Mm -hmm. But did John's audience know what? anything about helicopters? And, and, and you know, th you know there people wrote these things down in books claiming to be experts in these matters. So we're, we're not picking on um, somebody in the corner doing, these are, you know, these, these are people who trained and, 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 mm -hmm. and taught by someone somewhere. Um, popular books. Popular, very popular books that, that sold. And millions. Millions of copies. Um, the idea is to try to take mm. this symbolic, I'm sorry, first century mm -hmm. symbolic coded language yeah yeah let's let, let's back up john the apostle john is a prisoner mm -hmm. on exile in exile on an island called patmos he is there because of his faithfulness to the gospel and at that time it um, as things are going left for um, the Roman emperor, he begins to blame Christians for all the problems of the empire. Mm -hmm. Some of the things he's writing to some of his people, he's writing in a way so that it can be read. Because remember, mm -hmm. we're in a mostly illiterate culture. Yeah. Everybody couldn't read it. Somebody had to read it out loud. And the person who was reading it out loud, if he just said the emperor ain't no good, <laughs> was going to get locked up. Right. So he has to use symbolic language, what, what we would consider in some ways perhaps coded language. Mm. And he's saying things, this doesn't make it any less true or holy or anything. He's saying things about present things and future things in ways that his audience would hear and understand, but it would not cause them to have to suffer in the way he is. Remember, we just said the writers have pastoral concerns. And so what are these things then? Well, I don't we I, I can't tell you what it is. Don't know. It is it is whatever's <laughs> gonna come up out of this bottomless pit <laughs> when that particular mm -hmm. trumpet blows. Yeah. And when that happens, we'll be like, that's what that's it is. That's what it was gonna be. Okay. That makes sense now. I Wh see it. Which actually drives home the next point for us. And that is this, that you don't need to try to understand everything. No. You cannot understand everything. As a matter of fact, when Daniel was having all these visions and this angel, Gabriel first shows up in Daniel. Mm -hmm. When he shows up there and gives him this vision, Daniel walks away <laughs> right. and says, I don't understand this. I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay. Now, we get it in hindsight. We got it now. But Daniel, as he's receiving this revelation, this apocalyptic revelation, he walks away in chapter 8, verse 27. You can look at that and says, I just don't get it. And, and let me say this also. Peter affirms that. Mm -hmm. Peter writes explicitly that we are privileged because we can see it, see Christ for who he is and what he has done. He says that the old covenant prophets longed to see what Peter and his uh, uh, fellow apostles saw firsthand because they wrote mm. without fully grasping all that they were writing. Mm. Mm. And if, if the one God gave it to didn't fully understand it, mm. then we can. So why do we have this passage? Why do we have something where we don't exactly know? Okay, in appearance, the locusts were like horses. Mm -hmm. On their heads, they look like crowns of gold. Faces like human faces. Hair like women's hair. Teeth like lion's teeth. Breastplates like breastplates like breastplates of iron. Noise like uh, of their wings, like men in uh, chariots and horses. What do we know? What do we know? Well, here's what we know culturally. Mm -hmm. We know that these were going. This was going to be an organized army. Horses prepared for battle. Mm -hmm. We know that they were going to have, whenever you see crowns or horns in scripture, it speaks of power. They're going to be strong. Yeah. 
Yeah. Human faces speaks of intellect. Whenever there's a beast with a, when one of the faces is human, it means they're smart. Yeah. They have intellect. Um, the, the hair like women's hair uh, speaks of something attractive, the idea that, that again, we'll see later on in Revelation that even after all of this carrying on and they see Jesus, some people <laughs> are still going to follow Satan. Yeah. Uh-huh. There, there is something uh, alluring there. Yeah. Then there's going the lion's teeth. They're vicious. We know these things. Yeah. Now, what it is exactly, I don't know, don't know. exactly until it comes. But then... I, I'll know, but what I do know is this is a bad joint. These <laughs> these folks, this thing, this entity, this army that's rising during these last days are mm. going to be vicious. They're mm. going to be intelligent. They're going to be organized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what amplifies the message of hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Don't fall away. And these people know exactly what locusts do. Yeah. They tear. They devour. They tear up everything. They tear up everything. Everything productive. Yeah. That you've spent your entire. Mm. Uh, you you planted, you've watered, you've you've weeded, you've tilled, and all that stuff, and then the locusts just come and they take everything productive. Mm-hmm. They take everything productive, and that's the idea here. Stay with Christ, stay mm-hmm. faithful to Christ, be be comforted by the fact that you know He's going to say to several of those churches, "If you overcome, mm-hmm. you'll get a crown. Mm-hmm. If you overcome, I said before you an open door. Those kinds of things. If you stay with Christ, you're going to be fine." But man, falling away puts you at risk mm. of running into this kind of foolishness. Yeah. And there's a whole lit- litany of things mm. um, that, that, that John is going to talk about in that way. So, so we got two other interpretive principles. And I want to get to the rapture because I promised y'all rapture. <laughs> I promised y'all I was going to help y'all with the rapture. So, so other thing is that scripture interprets scripture. This mm-hmm. is a general biblical principle that you always have to understand that scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. Yeah. So that even within a book, you will find interpretations of different symbols. For example, in Revelation 1:20, um, there's a bowl of incense that shows up in mm-hmm. Revelation 1. And John is told that this bowl of incense is actually the prayers of the saints. Prayers of the saints. Which has been symbolic throughout the Old Testament that incense are the prayers of peop- of mm-hmm. the people, right? Yeah. So they understand what that means. But again, with this image in Revelation 9, we don't we know generally what these things are right. and what they do, but we don't know specifically what that's going to look like. What we have is Old Testament history where God uses locusts as destructive judgment Mm -hmm. judgment that destroys and that's again so here we go when you read the names abaddon Mm -hmm. and uh, apollyon you're talking about the names that mean destruction and destroyer Mm -hmm. so we know that locusts in the old testament are used by god or are a sign of judgment destruction we know that here now is it a helicopter I guess maybe it could be, but <laughs> maybe I guess <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> but just don't know. Yeah, we don't know. We can't. We can't. We can't know. All right. So let's look at two poop, two passages. I want to look at the four beast mm-hmm. in Daniel, which I think is going to be a good one for us. Oh, yeah. And then I also want to look at the rapture passage in First Thessalonians because I think that's going to be a good one too to close out, yeah. close up on. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. let's close up on getting caught up. I <laughs> think <Thank you>, so. <laughs> So we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 7. Um, this is part of Daniel's vision here in his book. And most of y'all stop after six chapters mm-hmm. because that ain't as spooky as what. Well, it is a little spooky. Some, some, you got, you got some, some, some people don't even get to the end of chapter six. Y'all stop at the lion's den. <laughs> and uh, But we got we to gotta go further. Yeah, we got to go a little bit further and look at chapter seven and this vision that he has. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, 
It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dom- dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I'm, I'm going to read eight. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of its first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Whew. Okay, there's a lot here. But here's the thing. Daniel had already had a conversation with the king of Bab- Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, mm-hmm. about him and the statue that he was right. building. So in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he sees in this dream a statue. Mm-hmm. His head has is gold. Its uh, chest and uh, torso are silver. Legs are uh, bronze, and uh, the feet are bronze and clay Mm -hmm. and he's trying to figure out what it means daniel says hey what it means is you're the golden head it's good right now for you there's somebody coming after you it's gonna be a little bit less but Mm. they still gonna be hot then (laughs) it's gonna be another nation to conquer them and another nation that conquers them and then there's this big rock come on that's gonna come that's gonna be cut out of a mountain without human hands and it's going to roll downhill, and as it rolls downhill, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to destroy the whole image. Mm. So Nebuchadnezzar sees that, hears the interpretation, and he builds this <laughs> he image. Goes, he goes out and builds the image. He builds the image, <laughs> but he doesn't build it with gold and silver and all of the other elements. No, he builds it all of gold mm-hmm. in defiance of what God said. Hey, you got a season. It's going to be gold for you for a while, but it ain't going to be gold for you always. He says, no, it's going to be gold head to toe. Gold. And that's what he wants everybody to bow down to. And that's where Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, who you know is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, say, we ain't bowing down to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it ain't going to be golden for you always. And that's why you got a fiery furnace in mm-hmm. Daniel. Mm-hmm. Because of someone being resistant mm-hmm. to the proclamation that God had given them. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to get another one. Now we're in Belshazzar's time. Nebuchadnezzar and God have had their twos and fro's, and God has won out over Nebuchadnezzar, uh, which I'm, we'll talk about in a second. I'm trying to hurry to get to it. <laughs> but now it's Belshazzar's turn. Belshazzar uh, is a successor, and now he's going to, during his day, there's going to be another example of the same principle. Yep. Now, here's the thing. The thing is that both of these pictures, mm-hmm. this golden, or this image of a, of a man head to toe, and these four beasts are pictures of historical kingdoms mm-hmm. that have already come. Yeah. And then conquering Christ comes and there are no more worldwide powers. Mm-hmm. Christ becomes the one who visibly rules. Mm-hmm. Now here's the key to this. Key to this again is to not try to be deep, deep. Don't be deep. This is it's symbolic. So this this lion with eagle's wings again represents Babylon, the kingdom that is ruling when the prophecy mm-hmm. preaching goes forth. One of their main images. One of their they 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 themselves identified themselves with mm-hmm. two images. Yeah. One was a lion. The other was an eagle. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's we that that's not hard to figure out <laughs> because they use that to identify themselves. The idea of the wings being plucked mm-hmm. is a picture of what God did to Nebuchadnezzar by making him go crazy, literally. He lived outside and his nails grew like eagle talons. Mm-hmm. Um, he was eating grass like an animal. God plucked his wings. God humbled him. Yeah. Then you have the bear. After the Babylonians there would be the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. And the Medes and the Persians would be very vicious, albeit not as royal or regal in terms of historical um, um, notoriety as the lion 
mm. would be. Uh, still very vicious, three bones in its mouth. Mm. Um, um, they would conquer the Babylonians, the Lydians, and they would conquer the Egyptians. Yeah, And they said it was raised up on one side, which is Cyrus, who had vassal yeah. mm-hmm. people under him, right? Exactly, raised yeah. up on one side because they're two nations that become kind of one nation, yeah. but the Persians are the stronger, yeah. more prominent yeah. um, nation. And Cyrus is actually the one that's going to allow Israel to go back home after they've been in Babylon uh, for uh, that period of time. And then you have the leopard, uh, which represents the Greek empire. Mm-hmm. The Greeks uh, were um, uh, led by Alexander the Great, yep. who sat and looked at the world and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and at an early age and in a short time, 12 years, took him 12 to years. conquer the entire known world. He conquered the military genius, um, an incredible strategist, and that's what the leopard with wings yeah. represents. He's fast. His speed yeah. to conquer the world. And then this beast that was like no other with iron teeth represents Rome, which was a vicious, horrible, incredibly oppressive mm. um, uh, empire. And it is in that context mm. I can, I, can I read a little more Bible? Yeah, we Bible have to. Study? We have to. In, in verse, we have to. In verse 9, he says, as I looked, mm. thrones were placed. Yes, sir. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Mm. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands serve him. Again, remember scripture sometimes is symbolic. This is not a literal number. It just means a whole lot of folk. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Mm. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. Watch verse 11. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. So there was Rome is represented by these Caesars. We don't have time to go into all of them. Mm. Um, But there's this there's this there's this real, real arrogant uh, Caesar who rises and, and who's going to try to stamp out Christ in his church. That little horn is mm. speaking. As I look, the beast was killed. Mm. This beast that's like no other that we don't even have a description for. And its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but the li- their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. What is he talking about? He's talking about Rome in its in the height of its power. Mm is conquered by the Christ. Mm. Man, John. That's so, oh, so good. I, listen, the thing that the that the disciples asked Jesus, was he going to do, he had already he done. He already did it. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He had already done that. He mm. conquered Rome, though he didn't look like he was conquering. He conquered Rome by taking their most vicious, torturous, mm. um, oppressive, um, form of capital punishment which was a cross and making it his means of redemption and reconciliation mm. for the world for anyone who come to faith in him wow he took their worst and made it his best <sighs> man and, and then you have a god who takes the experiences of these folks in daniel fiery furnace mm-hmm. thrown the beast yeah. lions den and does the same thing to these empires he throws them into a furnace into and, a furnace. and, to, and these beasts to the furnace. He, he, he does this great reversal here. Yeah. And then John turns around in the most Christ centric way and says that this ancient of days, that same one that is named here, yeah. who the Israelites would have, would have known as Yahweh God. Mm-hmm. He says this same white as snow clothing uses the same, th- the same wool hair. Uh, yep is on the son of man that shows up later. So he conflates Mm -hmm. who Daniel is talking about here in being the ancient of days, God, the father and Christ, the son and saying that he is the ancient of days. He is the alpha and omega. It's just making the connection between the two. John, here's the key to understanding all the apocalyptic literature. You ready? Here it is. Where is Jesus in this? Mm. That's good. That's true. Because when I read Daniel, when I read Revelation, mm. if I can find Jesus, I can understand it. Yes, sir. Mm. Mm. What is this? Is it a helicopter? I don't know. Where is Jesus in this? <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what's going to happen? What, 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 how many, you know, mm. who, who are the people? Where is Jesus in this? If I can find Jesus, mm. then the rest of it unfolds. Yeah. 
clearly, if I can find Christ and his cross, I will find his victory mm. and his purposes. Mm. And the rest of the passage unfolds before me. And I say, oh, that's why this. Yeah. Oh, that's why that. Yeah. Because Christ is the key to all biblical interpretation. I don't have time tonight. <laughs> if I did, he I'd is get the happy. Key. And I wish we had time too, because oh my! All right, so First Thessalonians, y'all start yeah, turning there yeah, in First Thessalonians yeah, four. Yeah. But I hope, P, I hope they made the connection of this stone dropping from heaven. I did not explicitly say. Let me explicitly say. <sighs> Please do so. What we refer to in Daniel chapter two, the stone that is hewn out of the mountain, cut out of the mountain without any human hands, is Jesus Christ who rolls down the hill, comes through from eternity into time, and he destroys that image, mm. uh, which means he conquers all worldwide powers. He does so mm. by his cross. Mm. He does so by his cross. Mm. I want you to be clear mm. that there is no form of earthly oppression that has not already been conquered at the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Already. Okay, let's talk about the rapture. First Thessalonians four, and this is uh, Paul writing to a community at Thessalonica who is being persecuted, and some of them may have concerns about folks who have gone on to be with the Lord. Yeah, and so so Paul, and, and, go ahead. And, and they thought some of them thought they had missed. They thought the, they missed it. They thought he, Jesus came back <laughs> and left them. That they, sounds they, familiar. They were the left behind. <laughs> they, they were left behind. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds very familiar. They, they really did think that. <laughs> and so Paul stands up and says, but in verse number 13 in chapter four, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep. Uh oh. We're going to talk about that sleep here. Mm -hmm. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with those words. All right, let's talk about, first of, first of all, let's talk about this sleep language. Let me, let me back up even before that. <laughs> let, me, let me back up before anything, and I'm going to begin at the end to be at the beginning. Why are we? Why do we have this passage? Mm -hmm. The last line of this That's it. piece is, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Literally, you know, old King James says, comfort, literally strengthen one another. Mm -hmm. So here's what we have. He opens by saying, I don't want you ignorant, but I do want you encouraged. Yeah. So everything between them is meant to is for my n knowledge, but not just information, for mm -hmm. my encouragement. Mm -hmm. Sleep ain't sleep. <laughs> it is it's symbolic <laughs> language. The idea of soul sleep. You know. You just went right into it. He said yeah, sleep man. ain't sleep. I mean, I know, you know, I'm sorry. We, we, the time is running, man. Um sleep is sleep is colloquial. Mm -hmm. It it's 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 a saying. So when he says those who fall asleep, he means those who have passed on. Mm -hmm. The Bible is replete, it is full of passages that prove that we are conscious. Mm -hmm after we have left this life and began the next. Mm. So we do not lose consciousness only to have to be awakened again mm. in the sense that you fall asleep at night. It is not that kind of idea. The idea is falling asleep is just in the same way a dead body, you look at somebody and say, oh, they just look like they're sleeping when the undertaker does a good job. Oh, they just look like they're sleeping. It, mm. is, a, it mm. is a way of expressing that the person has passed on, that they have died. Yeah. So that's what he's saying when we talk about those who've fallen asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's talk about this idea of being caught up with the Lord in his second coming, because there's a grave misunderstanding of what the Lord's coming kingdom is going to be like. Um, and a lot of people do believe that we're going to be caught up in heaven and we'll be we'll stay there. Yeah. Well, goodness gracious. <laughs> 
So <laughs> we use the term. Mm. I use it. Mm. It's part of our yeah, it heritage is. to yeah. say going to heaven mm -hmm. when I die. I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but God is not going to throw away the earth. In fact, the end of the book of Revelation is very clear that yep. God creates a new heaven and, and a new earth. First of all, there are three heavens in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's the sky or the atmosphere where the birds fly. Yep. There is, that's what we call the first heavens. The second heavens is space. It's where the stars are, the moon, mm -hmm. um, the sun. is, in, And then the third heavens are the unseen, immaterial world mm -hmm. that exists where God is, um, where we commonly think of heaven being. Um, but the first two are material places in the first place, mm -hmm. um, yes. places of time, space, and matter. Uh, so, yes, heaven, but also earth. <laughs> also <laughs> earth. We will be, Jesus' body is a prototype. His resurrected body is a prototype. Mm -hmm. His resurrected body, he was able to eat. He told people to touch him. Yeah. He had on clothes. Um, he was he was tangible mm. in the same way our resurrected bodies will be tangible. Yeah, that's the promise of the resurrection. If there's no body, it's not a resurrection. Yeah, yeah. It it, it we be cast but a friendly Christian at that point. <laughs> so we are what we would what would what will happen is our if we pass before his coming, mm. if we go before he comes, we will separate the soul and spirit from the body. The body will go to the ground. The soul spirit of the person who believes in Christ goes to be with him now, awake. Mm. In the presence of the Lord, the psalmist says, is the fullness of joy at his right hand of pleasures evermore. Then he's coming back. Yeah. And there will be a reunion of that spirit soul. He will reconstitute if there has been decomposition in the physical body and boom. Now you got a soul in a body like you have now, but without the sin mm. nature tendencies that we still carry in our flesh. Yeah. So the idea of being caught up is a it's simply being brought back to the life or the existence he intended initially. Mm. Is that, a, John, does yeah, that make sense? I, I just don't want people to think that we have some ethereal hang time. Yeah. Like we, like we Jordan <laughs> going from the free throw line. Yeah. Like, like literally there's a, there's a reason why he's saying that so that he could come and establish his kingdom yeah. in the new earth. Like there's yeah. a new heaven and a new earth. And so there's going to be an existence that we all have that you'll be able to tangibly, your yeah. body will reconnect with yeah. your spirit and your soul. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 one of the things that I, again, that I, it does not demit. In fact, to me, it amplifies. I wouldn't want to forego the privileges of earthly pleasure that God intended. I, I never will forget years ago, one of my dad's students mm -hmm. in Washington D.C., one of my favorite preachers named James Sturdivant said, you know, we've never really tasted what an apple should have tasted like. Hmm. We've never really, we ain't had a grape yet. <laughs> <laughs> because sin has tainted everything. And the creation is groaning, according to Romans chapter 8, waiting on us to be fully revealed into all that God has intended for us to be. And when Christ comes back, whatever that garden fruit tasted like mm. I want to be able to taste that thing man. I want to know what was the plum supposed to be like you telling me that the pot liquor is going to be next what, level what, what? what's the pot <laughs> <laughs> what glory is going to be in that pot liquor when ain't sin involved mm. yeah. and that's 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 what we are looking forward to yeah is 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 a is a reset <laughs> as it were um but more than a reset a redeemed set mm. uh of 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 god's intention for creation so that we don't go and and lose and live in ignorant innocence but we live with the 
with the full grasp of grace that affords us that privilege of experiencing mm. God's original intention. And I, 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 I'm, I don't want to get happy right there because mm. I will. Mm. And that's what ought to be encouraging. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Growth Factor podcast. Hopefully you all were encouraged and blessed by this session on the apocalyptic literature and you better understand it now and how to interpret it. We're looking forward for you all joining us next go round as we look at the epistles and the letters. Would you do us a favor? Go over to any podcast platform and follow us on those platforms, but also leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you all. We also want you to join our growing Growth Factor family over on Facebook. Just search for the Growth Factor on Facebook and you'll find a community that will help you to grow here. This has been the Growth Factor, a broadcast ministry of St. Mark Baptist Church. Be sure to follow this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and join our Facebook group, The Growth Factor, for daily motivational content. Let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for listening.